Okay, I think we are recording now. Let's double check. Yeah, we're recording. And we are on our last class today of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Um, meaning that we've uh, done in this series, we really started from the period of the Beis HaMikdash with Hillel and Shammai. We talked about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was really the bridge in between those eras um, from the destruction, saving Vespasian and all of that, and saving Yavna, moving the Jews up to the north. We spoke about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai last week, and we talked about the period of the revolt when um, uh, the, the Jews started to try to revolt against the Bar Kochva revolt um, and how the Rav Shimon Bar Yochai was hunted after that. Um, and um, now we're at the period really after that, and Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi really is the bridge in between, um, I would say, the warring period of the Romans, whereas uh, now he's coming to the period of time where we're going to work together, so to speak, with the Romans, or at least have a government. It's almost like the, the post-Holocaust Germany era that he heralds in and really sets the tone for the Jewish people for the rest of the exile. So um, we'll start a little bit backwards today. Let's we'll start, there we go, Rabbi Yehuda's tomb is in Beit Sha'arim National Park, um, which is uh, unfortunately closed these days. Um, Beit Sha'arim is an incredible site in Israel where we have, uh, they've uncovered their hundreds of graves, sacrifices um, from the period of the Mishnah and the Talmud. And one of the things I point out to people when I would bring them there is that in addition to, as we spoke about, losing the Beis HaMikdash um, and losing really the concept of centralized um, worship of Hashem, which was what the Beis HaMikdash really was, and sort of moving that concept into the shul concept, the Beit Knesset concept that we talked about, where we would establish prayers in place of the sacrifices, um, now we were moving into a period where um, the Jews are going to be, uh, um, you know, doing instead of the base of English, we have our regular alternate services um, that we do today. But we lost something else when we lost Yerushalayim, when the Jews were thrown out of Yerushalayim pretty much after the Bar Kokhba revolt. And that was we lost Harazesim, Mount of Olives. And Mount of Olives was... Um, just turn on that video there. Okay. Uh, Mount of Olives um, it was the traditional Jewish burial ground um, from the times of the Bayes Rishon, even from before Bayes Rishon, possibly. And um, we have graves over there. Um, and they would bring Jews from all over the place to there. When we come to Beit Sha'arim, right now, when the Jews moved up north, they're banned from Yushalayim after the Bar Kokhva revolt. And now we need a new central burial place. And Beit Sharon becomes that central burial place. And in fact, when we go there, we find graves, um, tombs from all over the world, uh, from as far as India, from Asia, people would bring their um, people, just as they do today, to Eretz Yisrael. And these are different sacrifices, as you can see, quite decorative, that they had back then. Um, can we see, do you see the whole, you don't see the whole screen, do you? What, uh, do you, how come I'm not getting the whole screen over there? Do you see the whole screen? Yeah, I think so. Or do you just see a small, here we go, okay. I think go. we see the whole thing. Okay, all five pictures, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Yes. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm just on my other camera note. Um, so here you see these very, very elaborate, fancy, almost not even Jewish looking sacrifices. On the top left, we have these lions and a bull. We have these ornamental designs, face of a lion over there. You have these scary wolves on the right side. You have these uh, angels, which are baby cupids or known as Nike, almost Greek mythology. Um, and uh, we find all of these tombs there in, um, um, in Beit Sha'arim. Um, now, I told you originally that this is the tomb of Rebbe. How do we know that this was the tomb of Rebbe that we found over there? There was no green sign that was there that said the cave of Rebbe when they 
excavated there. That was put afterwards. So, in fact, the one of the I, and I actually tell people there are not too many. To most of ninety percent of the tombs that we have in Eretz Yisrael, I mentioned, they come from. Um, they come from the. Uh, Ariak Kadosh that we talked about in the 1500s, who went around and was talking to dead people and he identified them. This cave, particularly, we don't need the Ariak Kadosh for, I tell people. This is one of the ones that you can know you're coming here, you're davening by the cave of Rebbe. And how is that? Well, Rebbe actually left the will, and we'll see parts of it later on. You'll see parts of that will later on that we'll talk about. But one of the things that Rebbe said is he goes, I want to be buried in the ground. And you ask yourself, what do you mean you want to be buried in the ground? Isn't everybody buried in the ground, right? And um, until you come here, you don't really realize it. But then you realize that, in fact, they weren't. They were buried at a two-part burial process where they would bury the person in a tomb, in a sacrifice like this. Um, and then they would, after a year, take the bones out and they would put all the bones together in a family plot. Um, and these are very, very elaborate. Um, we come into that tomb that I showed you up over here, and we walk in there, and all of a sudden we find this. Something totally different. We find two graves that are carved into the ground. Wow. So right away that tells us there's something different going on here. You have this elaborate cave, and then unlike all the other ones where we find these big sacrifices, we find two tombs in buried into the ground. And in fact, what Rebbe was trying to do was establish, and what he did do was establish what we have until today, is that we don't have fancy coffins. We, fa we bury as simple as possible. Rebbe was the wealthiest person of his times. And we'll see that also, right? And yet Rebbe said, I'm not spending thousands of dollars on you know some fancy sacrifice. Bury me in the ground, and here we have him and his wife. Okay, so we, just because we have that, that doesn't tell us for sure that's Rebbe. But there is another um, Gemara that tells us about Rebbe. I'm going to jump to the end over here. Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Here we are. Okay. So it says over here, it says, um, when Rebbe was dying, when he was dying, Amar Levni, he said to his sons, I need to have my children. Nicholas Uban of Etzlo, his children came in to him and he said three things to them. We'll talk about the first two things later on. The first is be careful about your mother. Two is make sure you have a candle lit and this table set every by my place. Um, and my, my couch would be by my place. And the last thing he said, Yosef Chafni and Shimon Efrati, Heim Shimshuni Bechayai, Heim Shimshuni Bemosi. They served me, these two students of mine, Yosef Chafni and Shimon Efrati, served me when I was alive. They should also serve me when I am dead. Okay, I mean that he wants, he's giving his will who should go ahead and take care of his burial. The problem was, the Gemara then tells us that Yosef Chafni Hashem already served during my life, will serve my death. It was understood that the Rebbe was speaking of this world, that these two should serve him in his death and in his burial. The problem was that they died first. <laughs> they died before Rebbe did. Uh, they saw, and he saw that their our own, their coffin preceded his coffin. So he said, from here we see that he wasn't speaking about this world. He was speaking about the next world. And the reason he says this was that people should not say that there's something wrong with them. Oh, you see these two students die, something terrible. You know, they died before the rabbi. That's a terrible thing. So Rebbe was telling them, no, that the reason why they died was because they were there. They were going to go up to heaven and prepare heaven, so to speak, for Rebbe. And the reason is that people would not say something wrong with them until now, too, was the merit of Rebbe that benefited them and prevented them from dying. Due to this is, now Rebbe's dying, his merit no longer protects him. Therefore, he clarified the reason for the death was in order to enable them to escort him to death. Okay, but who's going to take care of Rebbe's burial then? So the Gemara continues. The Gemara says, Rebbe, you know, he then said, I'm a Chach I need Tzarech, I need the rabbis. Nechnus was the Chach Yisrael. The rabbis came in and he said to him, Altis Paduni Be'ayaros. Don't go ahead and eulogize me in the big cities. Hoshivo Yeshiva Achar Shloshem Yom establish a yeshiva after 30 days that I was dead. And then the last thing over here is the three names that are important to me. Shimon Bani Chacham, my son Shimon will be, is a wise man. He'll take, fulfill up that rabbinic position. Gamliel Bani Nasi, Gamliel will be my 
um, the prince of Israel afterwards, the leader, and Hanina Bar Chama, that's his student, Rabbi Hanina Yeshev Barosh. He will be the head of the yeshiva. Okay, so we have three names here, and seemingly these three names are the ones that will take care of Rebbe's burial because the other two students died. Going back up here to the tomb of Rebbe. Here we have the tomb of Rebbe again. And right after that, if you go to the room right before Rebbe, what do we find in that room? We found three inscriptions. The first one over here on the right says, Rabbi Shimon. The second one says, Anina Hakatan. And the third one says, Shele Rabbi Gamliel. And then it says that in, in, in Latin as well, or Greek, right? You can almost make it a Rabbi, C-R-I-B, Gamliel. So to find these three names right outside of the tomb of Rebbe, right, in the ante room after that, and we find in the Gemara that it says that these three people are the ones that are going to be taking care of him, and then it seems that they were buried next to him. That certainly tells me, oh, this must be the caver of Rebbe over here. But if you really want to be skeptical and cynical, which many people are, you say, well, maybe Hanina, Gamliel, and Shimon are like Tom, Jacob, uh, you know, and Cliff. <laughs> right? Maybe those are names that are just, you know, standard names, you know, Beryl, Schmeryl, and Yankel. Everybody had those names, right? How do you know that those are the same people? So there is one more clue that we have. Remember, Rebbe said that after he dies, they should go ahead and put a base medrash by his grave. And in fact, we find that in a different medrash as well. It says that after he died, they established a base medrash by his tomb. And sure enough, here's the tomb of Rebbe. And if you look on the top of that tomb over there, you see there's a little space over there all the way up on top here. And if you look closely, what do you see? You see all of these benches on the right. These are the benches of a base medrash. This is what they would sit on. So here we have Mamish, the grave of Rebbe, where we have the base medrash. We know that the Rebbe's buried in the ground. And so starting from the end of the story with the death of Rebbe, Right, it's certainly one of the places that I like to take people to where you can literally take Chazal and you really get a sense that this is they're identifying for us um, on, on where Rebbe, Rebbe is buried and where we can daven, which certainly not a lot of people come here, unfortunately, to Beit Sharim, even though it's a fascinating site. Um, it's certainly on the yard site of Rebbe, he doesn't get a lot of people that even come here because it costs money to get in. <laughs> because it's a national park as well. But um, it certainly is a special to come here. It's Hashem, they'll visit. We'll be able to take you guys over there and see some other very fascinating things. So once we've gone from the end of the life of Rebbe, um, let's go back and see who Rebbe really was. So let's go to the next slide over here. Yeah, excuse which me, really, where, where, where is Beit Sha'arim? Where is that? It's in Kiryat Tivon, not far from Tsipori. Um, in the lower Galio, in the beginning of the lower, about 10 minute drive from Yoknam. Um, if that helps you at all. Um, but you know, 25 minutes from Haifa, I would say. Okay, so now then let's go, where does Rebbe start? And all of a sudden I've already started, you can tell, you know, we're still left over from last week on our uh, Gilgulim class. But the first place in our Torah where we have a mention of Rebbe, it goes back to um, Rivka. Rivka is pregnant. Rivka Imenu is pregnant, and she has two. Um, two. Uh, she, whenever she goes by the Avodah Zara house, it kicks us one way, and when it goes to the base of Medrash, it kicks the other way. She goes to the Navi Shame and asks her what's going on, and he says to her, "Vayomer Hashem Lan Hashem tells her Shnei Goyim Bevitnech." You will have two nations in your belly. You have two nations, two nations, uh, two separate peoples will come out, separate from your um, from your innards, uh, from your body. One people shall be mighty than the other. The older one shall serve the younger one. Rashi on that pasuk, shnei goyim bevitnech, and Rashi is again quoting Chazal, notes that it says the word geyim, not goyim, it says geyim with a two yuds in it right over here. And Gayim sounds like mighty people, like Kiga'o Ga'al, like we said in Az Yashir. 
And so Rashi says, what's the shnei geyim? Elu Antoninos Verebi. The words written geyim, noble persons, which is an allusion to Antoninos and Rebbe. So it seems that the pinnacle of Yaakov, meaning we have Yaakov and Ace of there, the pinnacle of Yaakov is really going to be Rebbe. And the pinnacle of Asaf, right, which was ultimately Edom, which is Rome, is Antoninos. And those two forces that are inside of them in the proper way, right, were Rebbe and Antoninos. Those are representing the two nations. Um, to take it a step further, we have an interesting Gemara that tells us about Rebbe and Antoninus. It says it's a medrash. Actually, this is actually a quote from Tosfos. I'm going to read you the medrash, but let's see the Tosfos first. The medrash says, Cholav metame, cholav metahir. Milk makes one pure. Milk makes one tame. <laughs> when Rebbe was born, they decreed Shlolamo. There was a decree that you should not circumcise. Um, under the Roman period, the Ave the Ima Malu and his parents circumcised him. Obviously, they sent it to the Caesar. They brought Rebbe and his mother before them, and he was switched. Um, the baby was switched with the mother of Antoninus, and she nursed him until she nursed Antoninus until they brought him to the Caesar. Right? They opened up the Caesar. The Caesar sees he's not circumcised. He freed them. And the hegemon says, Ani ra'isi The guy says, what do you mean? I saw that they, they circumcised this baby. Must be Hashem is doing miracles for them. And they invalidated the decree against them. And it says in the end, the Tosa says that in the end, Antonius went to study Torah and he converted and he circumcised himself. So that's the short interversion. I'm going to read you the, uh, the longer version, at least translated for you the story um, from the way that it's brought down to the Menorahs. Hama'or brings it down. It says, uh, one time they made a decree, and that time Rabbi Noah was born, and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, his father, said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded us to circumcise, and these people are telling us not to circumcise? How can we leave the decree of Hashem and, um, and fulfill the gezera of the decree of this Russia? His father circumcises. When the governor of the city found out, he called him. He said, I have a lot of respect for you because you are the head of your nation. But the king's decree is the king's decree and I can't let you go. He says, what do you want? I'm not going to send the boy and his mother to the king and the king will decide what's going to be with you. He says, whatever you want, no problem. They sent Rabbi Nokanesh's mother and they went on the day and the evening they came to the hostel or the hotel of Antoninus ben Asviris. And at that time, the same time, Antoninus was born. Rabbi Nakar's mother went and talked to me. And she said to him, what's going on? She told her exactly what happened. And I circumcised him and they're taking me to the king. So the mother said, you know what? If you want, take my son who's not circumcised and give me your son and you'll escape and your life and you'll be alive and your son will, will live. And she did that. They came to the king and the uh, hegemon says they violated your decree. And the king says, let me see the child, like we saw. And that was circumcised. Hashem does miracles, right? When they came back to the house of their mother, the Rebbe's mother said to her, Since Hashem did a miracle for us through you, um, um, through your child, they will always be friends. And in the merit of the milk that Antoninus' his mother nursed Rebbe, uh, I'm sorry, that, that, it's that Antoninus nursed from Rebbe, right? Meaning Antoninus, this child, Antoninus, when had nursed, Rebbe's mother nursed him, um, he, he merited to learn Torah and he studied uh, and he served Rebbe and he became a king to his nation and he merited this world and the next world. So we have from this Gemara, something interesting over here, <laughs> the, Marsh, the Medrash is telling us that milk makes you pure and milk makes you impure. So from this, we see at least one aspect is that milk purifies. The mother's milk purifies. We learned this by Moshe Rabbeinu, right? That Moshe Rabbeinu wouldn't refuse to nurse from a non-Jewish woman. Um, 
refused to nurse from a non-Jewish woman, and then he was brought to Tzipor in Yocheved. So because the, the, the holy milk that he nursed from, uh, from, uh, from a Jewish mother is what really gives him the ability to, to speak with the Shechina. So here we have Antoninus, who was the opposite. He was from a Edom, from Asa, but he nursed from a holy mother, from, from the mother of Rebbe, and therefore he merited to study Torah. On the other hand, there seems to be one thing that stands out about this. It says, Choav mitame. It says, milk also makes you impure. Where do we really see from here that milk makes you impure? We see that milk can purify. We don't see the opposite in the Midrash over there. By the way, it's interesting. We find a similar thing. I found an incredible, incredible Midrash. I, you know, preparing this class, I found this Midrash here in Psikta uh, Rabasi that says a similar thing about um, Sarah Imenu. It said the Pasuk tells us that when Sarah Imenu um, gave birth to Yitzchak, she's 90 years old, and it says that she started to nurse, and it says, hey, Nika Banim, right? Sarah, Sarah will nurse children. Hold on, she didn't nurse any children, she nursed Yitzchak, right? Well, what does that mean, she nursed children? Um, hold on a second. Somebody is waiting to get in here. Uh, waiting room. Admit, sorry. Okay. Um, Amy Gabonim, sorry. Um, what, what children did she nurse? And so the Medrash says, Aya Umas Olam, the, the nations of the world brought their children to Sarah. Shatinikosan, that she should nurse them to fulfill the verse. Amy Gabonim, Sarah. The Yesh Mayhem, there are some people that brought their children to them. Bamas. Because they wanted, oh, sorry, maybe it's a miraculous woman, right? She's giving, she's nursing at age 90. So they brought her to go ahead and to experience that miracle. The age, ma'am, she have a name, Liv Duck. And there were some people that brought their children there to check if it's really true. Ah, baloney, I don't believe she's nursing. And they wanted to go and check her out. However, both of them, lo, if do, both of them did not lose out. Amr Rebbe Levi, Rebbe Levi says, Elu Shabo, Be'emes, the ones that came to check her out, their children ultimately converted to Judaism. Those are the souls of the non-Jews that converted. Right, that they went ahead and they he became built as part of Israel. The Elu Shabo lived because are the ones that came to go ahead and just check her out. They became like these prefects. They became very important people. And then he says something else, the matter ends off. The Chol Hagerim HaMizgairim Be'olam. And all of the converts that will get, that convert through all generations. The Chol Yirei Shamaim. And anyone that's God-fearing in the nations in the world. Right? They are all there. That comes from the holy milk that they nursed from Sarah Imenu. The mother of children is happy. Zusara. What a fascinating medrash where the medrash is telling us that all converts, they can claim that the reason why they converted, the medrash tells us, is because they nursed, right? As they were from the nations that came to Sarah Imenu to nurse. Okay, so we have Rebbe. Let's move a little bit further here. And what's next here? Okay, yeah. <coughs> So if Antoninus is um, Asaph and the convert, so to speak, on the other hand, we have Rebbe is from the soul of Yaakov, it tells us. It says, Ezehu derech yeshara. The Mishnah in Perek Yavasta talks about Rebbe. Every Rebbe, all the Tanaim have different Mishnahim. Ezehu derech shiover Adam. What is the straight path that a man should go ahead and choose for himself? Kol shehi tif eres something that is splendorous to him. To the ones that do it, and on account of it, it causes splendor to him from other people, right? Meaning that this is something that is, uh, you get a job that people, you know, appreciate, that gives you glory and gives other people, that glorifies other people with you. It's a strange terminology. It's awkward reading it. However, you know, uh, you guys were not here. We spoke a little bit about my Tishabov class, my, my Tubishvat class last week. Um, and we talked about the 10 different, uh, um, the uh, spheros, the, the attributes of Hashem. 
And we talked about chesed, gevura, tiferes, netzah, chod, yesod. We talked about the different, you know, mystical spheres. And we noted that each one corresponds to different of the forefathers, right? So chesed is Avraham, gevura, kindness, gevura is Yitzchak, tiferes is Yaakov. Tiferes is the blending of kindness and truth and, and, and din, and Yaakov is, represents that. The one word that Rebbe chooses, Rebbe being the soul of Yaakov Avinu, is the word Tiferes, right? Because that's again coming from the soul of Yaakov Avinu. The Ariya Kadosh says, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, why was he called Hanasi, the prince? Right? There was a lot of princes, none of them, none of them were called Hanasi. Nasi stands for Nitzutz Shel Yaakov Avinu. He is the spark of Yaakov Avinu. So um, Rabbi Yudha Nasi shares that spark of Yaakov Avinu. Um, and again, if Antoninus is, is Esav, Rabbi represents Yaakov Avinu. One last thing that is super interesting Actually, this um, I put on here literally five minutes before the class um, is another matter. The matter says that Rebbe lived in the city of Tsipori for Shva Esrei Shana, 17 years is when he lived in the city of Tsipori. We'll see the city of Tsipori soon. And Rebbe would say about himself, that just like Yaakov Avinu lived in Mitzrayim for 17 years, Chaya Yehuda b'tzibori shva esreishnen. Yehuda, right, that's me, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, I lived in Tzipori for 17 years, right? So again, we find that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is connecting himself to Yaakov Avinu. By the way, they're both in Golis, right? Yehuda Tzipori, Yehuda is in Tzipori, just like Yaakov Avinu leaves Eretz Yisrael and he's in Mitzrayim, right? Yehuda is living post the Beis HaMikdash, and Rabbi Yehuda is living in the city of Tzipori, um, outside when the Jews are banned from Yerushalayim. <coughs> what did Rabbi Yehuda do in, in, uh, um, in the city of Tzipori? So the, the pathway, I wasn't able to put all the different notes, there's was way too much to do. Um, but the, the derech of Rabbi Yudha Nasi, as we introduced it, was really to go ahead and to try to make Rome and Jews, to create diplomatic relationships between Rome and between um, Israel. And not only that, but to distance himself from the destruction of the base of Megdash, to tone it down. In fact, there's a Gemara that tells us, I didn't put it in here, that says that Rabbi Yehuda wanted to even nullify Tisha B'av. We shouldn't celebrate Tisha B'av anymore. We shouldn't mourn the Beis Amigdash because it's gonna it's gonna get the Romans all nervous that we're still mourning it, right? And they didn't listen to him, even though he was Rabbi Yudah It's one of those things that they didn't listen to him. But many of the things that Rabbi Yudah did, he established that the taxes should be collected over here. He also wanted to create a supremacy of Eretz Yisrael outside of Yerushalayim, making Tzipori the center of that. So we, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai, who we spoke about, spoke about two weeks ago, took the Jews from Yavna, they went to Usha, Beit Sha'arim, and they came to Tzipori. Rabbi Yehuda was in Tzipori, and that really became the... Ay. Um, Rabbi Yehuda came, the, uh, um, came to, um, uh, to Tzipori, and really, that's where he built his court over there. His primary... Um, job over there was to write what we call the Mishnah. And to, for that, I want to bring you to the introduction to the Rambam. The Rambam, when he explains um, what his work is about, goes through the history of the Jewish people from Moshe Rabbeinu. What is Torah? And he goes through all the generations from Moshe. And then he goes like this, Rabbeinu HaKadosh Chiber HaMishnah. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, Rebbe, compiled the Mishnah. From the times of Moshe Rabbeinu until Rabbeinu Kedush, lo chibru chibor shemalam dinos abrab metosh valpeh. We never ever learned out of a text the oral tradition. What did they do? The Chol Darvadar, the head of the Bezdin or a prophet that was in that generation, would write notes for himself from things that he had heard from his rabbi, and he would teach it over malpeh in public. Everybody would, would write their own little notes as much as their thing, but there was no books. <laughs> From explaining the Torah to the halachos, everything that he understood. 
and from different, and they would also write down the things that were introduced in every generation and uh, things that they extrapolated from the 13 Minos Adin that were accepted by the different courts. And that's the way that things worked from the times of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why is that? The reason is because the Gemara and Gittin tells us over here, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Nachmeni, Mitrogmini, Rabbi Shim Ben Lakish says, Kosov Lacha Es Hadvarim Ha'ela. One verse says that you should write down these things. That's talking about the Torah. And then another verse tells us, Ki Al Pi Hadvarim Ha'ela, by the saying over of these things, right? Ha'ketzad. Right? How is this possible? Are you saying it or are you writing it? Which one is which? So the Gemara tells us how Ketza Dvarim Shebik Sav, things that are written down, you're not allowed to go ahead and to say them orally. Right? When we go ahead and write a Torah, we can't write a Torah from memory. Precious Barolakim. It has to be written from one Torah scroll to another Torah scroll to another Torah scroll. You're not allowed to um, write the written Torah orally. It all has to be from a written text. And as well, Dvarim Shebal Peh, in the same way, the oral tradition, you're not allowed to go ahead and to say over the oral tradition from something that is written. The oral tradition has to be passed down orally. It cannot be just a book that you hand somebody. The very Rabbi Yishmael says, You're only allowed to write down the written Torah, but you're not allowed to write down the oral tradition, the Mishnahis. There's a biblical prohibition to do that. Before we get to the practical aspect of it, the genius of this system is is that Judaism is always going to be alive, right? No father could ever hand a book to their kid and say, read the book, right? This is what it's all about. You want to know Judaism? Judaism for dummies, right here. Read the book, all the halachas. No, the only way that Judaism is going to go ahead and be passed through is because there's always going to be a rabbi, a father explaining to his child, a rabbi explaining to a student. There's always going to be a relationship that, that teaches there. You can't just have a book. And that's really the idea of the system. And despite the fact that Rebbe did write down the Mishnah, breaking this law, which we'll talk about, right? But he wrote it down in a very shorthand form that it still needs explanation. So you can't just read the Mishnah and you're done with it. You're going to need a Rebbe that's going to explain it. And then even when we wrote upon that, the Gemara, that still needs more explanation. And everything continues like the Rambam writes his book. <laughs> Mishnah Tori says, if you have my book, you don't need any other books. Right, because this is all the Torah that you need is here in that book, right? And the irony of that always, you know, strikes me is that there is no book that has spawned more svarim about it than the Rambam, right? His book has spawned the most books possible. Um, so this is now that. So what did Rebbe do? Rebbe was breaking this law, and that's what the Rambam tells us. So Rebbe wrote the Mishnah. He took them all together. How did he do that? So it says, what did Rebbe do? Let's see what he did. Who keeps kol hashmo, as the Rambam continues. He gathered all the precedents and all the dinim and all the beurim and all the expositions and all the explanations that they heard from the times of Moshe Rabbeinu, right? So we're going back almost to Rebbe's living in the year 180 or so, right? 190, 200. So we're going back almost, a th uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. let's see, how many years? We're about almost a thousand years at least. Um, and he takes all of those notes, and we're talking about the best of each and every generation, right? The Hebrew Me'akol Sefer Mishnah, and he put them all together in a book called the Mishnah, and he started teaching this in public, you know, from the Mishnah, and it would, went out, sent it out to all the Jewish people, and everybody wrote it down, and it went all over the place in order that the Torah should not be forgotten from, forgotten from the Jewish people. So this is extremely radical. Meaning for a thousand years from the Torah, from the times of Moshe, this was never written down, never taught from a book. And Rebbe goes, here is the book. He's breaking a major law over here. <coughs> How does he do this? So the Gemara tells us, Ace, la, la, shem, hey, 
that it's a time to act for Hashem, your Torah is being negated. We learn that there is times when there, there are extenuating circumstances. We learned this halacha out from the story of Elio Hanavi in Mount Carmel, which is actually, you could see it. When I talk in Sipori, you know, sometimes I start off my day in Mount Carmel over there. And there Elio Hanavi goes ahead and he brings two cows, gathers all of the Jewish people with Achav over there, and he offers us, you know, and he has a, a cook-off. Who's, uh, who's, uh, who's the real God? Is ba Baal the real God or is Hashem the real God? You shech one cow, I shech the other cow. And um, whichever God sends down a fire, that'll be the real God. And Hashem does that, everybody bows down and they accept Hashem. The problem is Elio Navi is violating a biblical commandment. You're not allowed to go ahead and bring a sacrifice, which is what he's doing outside of the base Hamikdash. Right, but Elia Navi relies on this verse of extenuating circumstances. That at times when the entire Torah is going to be negated, we're losing the entire Torah. Then you're allowed to break the law to save the law. Similar to what we do on, you know, when we violate the law for Shabbos, we violate Shabbos to save a life. Right, we break the law, but this is even more drastic. This is for the entire Jewish people. So the Rambam explains. And he didn't leave it like the way it was because he saw that the students were getting less and less and the troubles were getting more and more. And this wicked um, Roman empire was spreading on the entire world and the Jews were getting thrown to different ends of the world. And he writes something that could be in the hands of everybody so that everybody will learn it quickly and it'll never be forgotten. And him and his whole, and his best and sat their entire lives and they taught the Mishnah in public. This was a major accomplishment. This was life transforming for Klal Yisrael. Um, by the way, Rebbe in breaking this law is doing a sin. I saw mentioned, how did Rebbe come to do such a sin? The truth of the matter is we have a, a sin as well um, that we find Yaakov Avinu does, right? Yaakov also does a similar thing. What does Yaakov Avinu do? He goes and he dresses up to steal the blessings from Esau, right? Remember that? He goes, it's, Anochi Esav I am Esav, your firstborn. Right? Yaakov also, same thing. He's going ahead and breaking the law. Don't tell a lie. And he's in order to, for the greater good, to get the blessings for the Jewish people. Rabbi Yudan Asi also has to break the law in order to save the Torah, save the Torah for the Jewish people. So I saw that somebody wanted to say, it says, that's what the Medrash back there was telling us. Remember that Medrash? The Medrash says, The milk purifies and the milk makes you impure. Right? Rebbe was able to go ahead and break the law because he nursed from Antoninus's mother. He had a little bit of impure milk inside of him right? that he drank. And that gave him the ability ah, to use that impure milk to be able to break the law, do an Avera Lishma, as they say over there. So that is... Um, um, the, the major accomplishment of Rebbe. <laughs> and here's the city of Tsipori, beautiful city of Tsipori, which is sitting on top of a hill. And in fact, in the city of Tsipori, we find a beautiful shul. Shul is from the fifth, sixth century, but Rebbe certainly, there was, we're told that when Rebbe died, they took him around to 18 different synagogues and they eulogized him in the city of Tsipori. And um, Rebbe, uh, and, uh, and so this is one of those synagogues that we found over there, which has this elaborate mosaic floor. Um, they actually, if you go there to the city of Tsipora, which is also a national park, they actually have a, a movie that they show of the life of Rebbe, which is a little bit cheesy, but not bad. One of the things that I like to point out over there on the mosaics on the floor over there that we have is that we have this mosaic there, and the one on the left, which is um, Bikurim. It's the fruits of the um, of the new year that the town, the Mishnah tells us they would bring it in these big baskets. Interestingly enough, right, we see that there are birds hanging upside down, and in fact, the Mishnah tells us that there were birds on the Bikurim, and it says, "What about how do you have? What's the problem when you have birds on a basket? The problem when you have birds on a basket is that they can either eat them." or even worse, they could poop on them, right? Um, and uh, how do you do that? So it says that they would hang them upside down. And this is again, a Mishnah that we have written by Rabbi Yudha Nasi. And when we come into this shul here from the period of Rabbi Yudha Nasi, we actually see 
this basket, a picture from that time with the birds just as described hanging upside down over there, which is fascinating. Now, Rebbe was able to accomplish the Mishnah because he had a very special relationship with Antoninus, who did, in fact, rise to glory. The question is, is this Antoninus Mar Marcus Aurelius? There's literally, people have their doctorates trying to identify which Antoninus this was. Um, but it tells us something interesting. The Gemara tells us, um, the Gemara and Gittin tells us, um, there was a tunnel that went from the house of Rebbe, uh, from from, Ibeze, from the house of Antoninus to the house of Rebbe. There was a tunnel. Antoninus would go and visit Rebbe, go through a secret tunnel. Interesting enough, the, another matter says it went from Rome to Rebbe, which is again strange. Why would it go from Rome? You can't have a, a tunnel going in Rome, obviously to Israel, right? But there was actually a Roman city in Israel called Roma. Um, they called it Rome. Look, like you have, you know, New York is after a place in London, right? Or in England. So here you have Rome in Israel and um, not far from Tsipuri. And in fact, they found tunnels that were from Rome, not making it all the way to Tsipuri, but certainly there were tunnels there, right? Which is nice to think about when you're reading this. So it says, Kol Yama, every day he would go there. He'd bring two servants with him. Um, we would kill one of the servants at the entrance of the house of Rebbe, and he would kill the other one at the entrance of his house so that nobody would know that he had visited Rebbe. He took his, his body, his bodyguards over there. That doesn't seem so nice. Um, interestingly enough, you know, it seems from a different Gemara that I saw mentioned that there were, he had a lot of people that he suspected were killing him. It was quite common to have enemies in the palace and soldiers that would try to kill you and poison you. Um, and uh, those would be the servants that he would bring with him. Um, and he said to Rebbe, when I come to visit you, I don't want anybody to know about this. This is a secret meeting. You know, I, this is, I can't let everybody know I'm visiting my Jewish, you know, the head of the Jews. <clears throat> one day it tells us that he found Rabbi Hanina Bar Chama. Remember, we talked about him. He was one of the three students of Rebbe, the two sons and the student. And he said, didn't I tell you when I come to visit, nobody else should be there? Rebbe said, don't worry, this is not a human being. Rabbi Hanina is like a malach, right? You don't have nothing to worry about him. He said, oh yeah? He said, go tell the servant that's outside there that he should come over here. Now, Antoninus had killed that guy already, right? So Hanina went outside, he found the servant that had been killed. And he said, uh-oh, what am I going to do? If I tell him he was killed, it's going to be a problem. Okay, I'm not going to tell him bad news. The servant was killed. If I let him go, I'll be treated. If I leave the Legina King with disrespect, I can't just disappear, run away. So he said, I shall have mercy. And he did Tchias Amazim. He brought the servant back to life again. And then Antonina sees that his servant that he just killed outside is back alive. He said, I got to be a long man before you. Even nobody goes, fine. I see that even the least among you can do Tchias Amazim. But next time I come, don't have anybody there, even somebody like Reb Hanina ben Chama. Let's try to keep this on the hush hush. The relationship between the two of them, the Gemara continues. It goes, it's a whole page of Gemara. I just took out some of the quotes there. It says, every day Antoninus would send Rebbe crushed gold in large sacks with wheat in the opening of the sacks. He'd hide the gold, bring this wheat to Rebbe, and they did not realize that the bags actually contained gold. And Rebbe said, I don't need gold. I have plenty of gold. He said, a gold should be for those who come after you. We'll give it to the last ones who come after you. And, you know, and they'll give tzedakah and you'll help them pay the taxes. Right? Antonis is secretly supporting Rebbe. It's, it's an incredible, incredible concept. Right? Gemara tells us another day, every day Antonis would minister to Rebbe and would feed him and give him to drink. When he went to his bed, and he would bend down in front of the bed and say to him, ascend upon me, climb on top of me to get to your bed. He said, you're the king. Uh, he goes, oh, if I should be Zeich to be next to you in Elam Haba. Another time he said to him, am I going to be married to go to Elam Haba? Right? After he said, Taka, am I going to be able to go to Elam Haba? I mean, you could see that this is a, 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 a relationship that's not normal, right? That that certainly is a, 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 a extraordinary. I'm like, and he says, ah, he says to the Pasuk and Avad, he says, Lo yes, sorry, the base Esav, that there's not going to be any remnants left of the house of Esav. So that means in the world to come, I'm, I'm from the house of Asaph, right? So he says, no, those are the only people that are doing the actions of Asaph, not like you, right? We have this relationship, Yaakov and Asaph, Antoninus and Rebbe. In fact, we're told the Medrash and other people, all the Mephorshams notice that the truth of the matter is, this was really the way it was supposed to be, right? 
Yaakov should never have had to steal the blessings. Esav and Yaakov's relationship were meant to be what ultimately we later find by Yisachar and Zavulun. Right? Yisachar sits and learns, and Zavulun will go out and make money and support him in Torah. The world was going to be divided up between Yaakov and Esav. And Esav was meant to be literally like we see that um, Athenese is doing, giving him money, supporting him, helping him, whatever I can do to help you. I'm taking care of this world. You're in charge of that world, the world to come. I'm setting you up over here and you'll set me up over there. Right? That's the relationship between the two. That's what it was ideally supposed to be. When Rivka Imenu comes all the way back there where we started talking and she says, right, I have two nations are in your room, two separate people issues. One people shall be mightier than the other, right? That's Esau is going to be stronger than Yaakov and the older one shall serve the younger, right? But the, the, the stronger, mightier one is going to serve the younger one. And the two of them will be able, it wasn't telling you that the, this isn't a curse. Normally we read this, it's like a curse. I have one lousy son and one good son, but don't worry, the lousy, stronger son... No, this is really telling you that the way they're supposed to be is that there's two exalted people. You have the neshama of Esav, neshama of Yaakov, and both of those are supposed to work in harmony. That's really the way the world is supposed to run. Um, unfortunately, Esav dropped the ball. But later on, that did happen. And when it did happen, right, the Mishnah was able to come out. Rebbe was able to, be able, was able to bring the revelation of the Torah to the entire world. It's because we had Esau, we had Yaakov, we had those blessings being revealed. He had the, the freedom, and then the Torah was revealed, which set us up for the next 2,000 years. The next 2,000 years, we're all living really from that Torah of the Mishnah that reviewed Hanasi passed on. <clears throat> now, when uh, we're going to jump, we're running a little bit later here. We're going to go to the time of, of Rabbi's death. Um, Actually, let's jump a little bit further over here before he dies. Here we go. Where is it? No. Um, no. 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 Would I be able to ask a question or would you rather wait to me, wait to the end? Um, let's hold off for another. Yeah, we'll do it at the end. I just want to get through this. Okay, it was related that on the day that Rebbe died, the sages decreed a fast and begged for divine mercy so that he would not die. Um, that um, the day that Rebbe was going to die, right? The, they, they made a task. They made a fast day. Everybody should die. Everybody shouldn't die. And they made a decree. Anybody that says the Rebbe dies, he duck her should be stabbed with a sword. Right? Meaning nobody's, nobody, nobody, no, no, we don't want any pessimists in the room here. Everybody's telling us this is it. We're davening as much as we can. What happened? Slika aim said the Rebbe Igra, right? The maid servant of Rebbe went up to the roof and she said something very interesting. She said, Al Yonim Avakshik has Rebbe. The, the upper worlds are already claiming Rebbe. They want him already. And the people down here in this world are asking for Rebbe. Let the um, um, let, uh, may it be the will of Hashem that the lower world should impose their will upon the upper world. Right? Let them, let the lower world win. This was her prayer. Let us win. Right? Right, the cholats would fill the Roman of life. They come and start that every time he had to go to the bathroom and he would go ahead and after he was suffering, every time he would take off his fill, and he was in tremendous, tremendous pain. You know, the Talmud tells us that he suffered from uh, for 13 years um, with gallstones, is one of the sicknesses. It was terrible, terrible pain. Um, and she saw that he was suffering too much. Amr said, She said, It's enough already. Ad Khan. Right, the upper worlds should go ahead and uh, win over the lower worlds. What happened? But the rabbis would not stop praying. They didn't want to listen to her. Right, so what did she do? Um, she took a kuza, shock like kuza. She took a jug, shadya me'igril ara. She threw it off the roof and all of a sudden made a huge crash. Right, everybody was quiet. And at that moment, 
they stopped davening, and Rebbe died. Um, right, go see what happened. He found over there that Rebbe died. Parkafra was actually buried in Carmiel, actually. Bar Kapara was in the students of Rebbe. He's buried here in Carmiel. Uh, he ripped his he put his tear backwards. Right, the great angels and the righteous mortals, right, both clutched, clutched the Aaron Kodesh. They were both holding on to the Aaron Kodesh. Um, and Nitzhu Arelim Es Hametzukim, right? And the angels won over the mortal men, right? Vinish Ba'aron HaKodesh, and the, the holy ark of Hashem was taken. Um, I don't remember another day. I don't remember another day, period. I don't remember another day that I got this email with those words three times in the same day. But I got them today. Today, this morning, I got, I, uh, this afternoon, that Reb David Soloveitchik was nifter. And again, the first email says, Ditzchu arelem esem etzukim v'nishbar na kodesh. That the heavens won, they took Reb David Soloveitchik, the reshiva of Frisk. Um, he's 94 years old. And then I got it two hours later, Reb Yitzchak Shiner, um, the head of Kamenetz, 98 years old. Again, Ditzchu arelem esem etzukim v'nishbar na Hashem. And literally 10 minutes ago in the middle of our class, I just got it the third time that uh, Rabbi uh, Professor Aaron Tursky, Tursky was nifter as well. Um, three, I mean, this, this is an un, unreal, uh, unreal day. To, but to see the words, and then I'm, and while I'm hearing this, I'm preparing this class where we see this is, all those comes back from, from really from Rebbe from this sense of that the world is over. We, we, all these gedolim that we've lost, <coughs> right? And, uh, but this is where it comes from. Amrulai, they said to him, Noch um, They asked uh, Bar Kapara, did he die? Amrulai, Asim Karmata, you said it. Anola come in, I didn't say it, because he was remembering that they said that nobody should say that Rabbi died. By the way, um, the, uh, this story isn't just a story, even in his death, Rebbe taught us Torah. Um, I've seen about three or four different responsa, right? In uh, modern day responsa, Rabbi Bleich brings it down to Tzitzeliezer, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. They all deal with this Gemara in modern terms, in modern halacha today, in the 21st, 20, what are we, the 22nd century, 21st century, 21st century, no, the 22nd century, whatever. Anyways, the, uh, no, uh, 21st century, the, uh, uh, that uh, whether end of life issues, somebody's in pain, somebody's in suffering, do we allow them to continue? Do we keep them alive or not? Um, on one hand, we see over here that the maid servant of Rabbi felt that uh, the prayers are, are just keeping in pain. And we should just, so to speak, pull the plug, which is what she did. She pulled the plug on the prayers. And is that appropriate behavior? On the other hand, the rabbis obviously didn't feel this way. They said, I don't care if he's in pain. We need him still. We need him still. And they're dominating and they're dominating. And who's right? And does that have any practical ramifications? Um, and certainly uh, there are poskim that seem to say the Aruch HaShulchan and others, the Ran is brought down as saying that if somebody is suffering, certainly we don't have to do extra things to keep them alive. Right. You may not be, you're, you're certainly not allowed to go ahead and to kill them. That, that we're never allowed to do. But you don't have to do extra, you know, go through uh, um, extra things to make sure that they are, to give them the extra things that will just uh, prolong their agony and their pain. Um, and so even in the death of Rebbe, he's teaching us Torah still, you know, 2,000 years later. It tells us that whenever he died, Vishas Petirasa Shal Rebbe, when he died, he raised up his 10 fingers to heaven, and he says, I toiled with my 10 fingers in the Torah, and I have not benefited from this world, even ke'etzbaktana, even like a small finger, right? And um, right, that I should have peace in my, in my, uh, in my resting place. a voice came out from him, right? That when you're, that, and we actually read this, we recite this uh, verse as well by, by funerals, recording this verse from, from Rebbe in Yeshaya, right? That they should rest in their beds in pieces, that this peace, that they should come in peace, they should go in peace. 
So we see that um, this Rebbe was, at one point, he was the wealthiest person. It says that he had everything that was not, there wasn't a season that he didn't have all the foods from that season there. But personal Hano, he didn't get anything from it. He goes, for me, it was all about the Torah. You know, he had to preserve a, uh, a dignified aristocratic, aristocratic uh, lifestyle because he's hosting Antoninus every day in his house. But at the same time, it wasn't for his own benefit. It wasn't for his own joy. Now, there is a fascinating Gemara that tells us over here that tells us that Rebbe left in his will, we saw part of it, um, he said to them, as a last will tell, be careful with the honor of your mother. The Gemara asks, what does that mean, be careful with the honor of your mother? The Torah tells us, keep it out of the aim. So the Gemara says that wasn't really his mother. It wasn't their mother. Rebbe had a second wife. And, um, and there was, it was their stepmother. And he said, you know, be, take care of her honor, even though she's uh, your stepmother. Then he said an interesting thing. My lamp should be lit in its usual place. My table should be set in its usual place. And the bed shall be arranged in its usual place. Huh? Like leave my makam kavua ready for me? What's going on over there? What does that really mean? So the Gemara tells us, do, 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 do. here we go. He says, Gemara says, what is the reason he made these requests? The Gemara says, every Shabbos evening after his passing, every Friday night, Rabbi Yudha Nasi would come to his house after he's dead, right? As he had done during his lifetime. And he wanted them, and he would make kiddos for his family. Every single Friday night, they would come, and he would come and visit, say kiddos for his family, just like he would, um, when, like he was still alive. That's why he wanted everything to be set up for him. Don't 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 put anybody else in my seat. I'm coming back still. Hahu Shemsha, one Friday night, right? A neighbor came by and knocked on the door, and the maid servant says, "Be quiet, Rebbe Yudanas is sitting. He's sitting at the table. Don't disturb him." Right? When he heard his maid servant reveals his presence to his neighbor, he didn't come back again. So it was not to cast aspersions on earlier righteous individuals. Was not appear to the families following their death. I mean, Rebbe had that power to come back after he was dead, right? So again, when I'm at the grave of Rebbe, Rebbe Yudanasi, I said, is he really there? I don't know. It's a strange Gemara. I mean, what does that mean that he came back after he was dead? What's that supposed to mean? Interestingly enough, we have a similar statement made about, you know who? Yaakov Avinu. It says that Yaakov Avinu, where did it go? Here, the Gemara says in uh, this Gemara that says the Yaakov Avinu is also alive. I think it's the Gemara in uh, where is it again? I forgot already. Basar is so they're eating already. We, we talked about this Gemara once before, and the Rabbi Yochanan said to uh, <coughs> Rabbi Yitzchak, uh, Yaakov Avinu lo meis. Oh, I'm sorry. He said, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak said to Rav Nachman, Yaakov Avinu never died. Um, he says he was in shock. I understand the Torah goes through a whole parsha telling us that he died, that, that he um that he um that they buried him and they eulogized him, they took him, and I, well, what are you talking about? He didn't die. He says, What do you want? I I am very much from the bus again. Says Al Tira Avdi Yaakov. Don't fear my servant Yaakov. I'll take us Yisrael. Don't be nervous. Yisrael. I will save you from a distance. And your seeds, your descendants from the land of their dwelling. So we see that Yaakov is connected by the by the Torah to his to his descendants. Just like Yaakov's descendants live on eternally, Afhu He also lives on eternally. In fact, there's Parshas Vayechi, right? It says Vayechi Yaakov. And um, I think I spoke about this. I believe it was in this class, but it could be another class that I gave, right? That, they, that there are two parts of Yaakov. There's Yaakov and there's the Yisrael. He has two names. And although it says that Yisrael died, right? And they buried Yisrael and they mourned Yisrael, but Yaakov lives on. Right? I have that, that Yaakov, hold on one second. 
um, that Yaakov, uh, that Yaakov lives on. And in fact, if you look at the verses, it's fascinating to follow the Pesukim where it doesn't mention anything about dying with Yaakov. It says Yisrael died, Yisrael, Yisrael, Yisrael. And, and that's where they're drawing from. There's some aspect of Yaakov Avinu that is eternal, that lives on. In that same way, if we believe that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi is part of Asa, part of uh, Yaakov Avinu, that same eternal spark lives on as well. And he can go up and down from this world to that world, just as Yaakov is. It's a power, that force of Rabbi Yehuda that still lives on. Um, interesting left, there's one more person that we say that uh, lives on. And actually, we say this by a Kiddush Levana. Um, and the Gemara tells us that it really started from Yavin. You guys have heard this beforehand, right? Who else lives on? Any guesses out there? Who else do we say on? Lives on forever. David oh. Melech Israel. Ah, David Melech, Melech Israel. Well, David Melech Israel, Chai Vekayam. There's no Pasuk in the Torah that says Melech Israel, Chai Vekayam. That comes from. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi established that Kiddush Levana, right, when we're renewing the, the, yeah. the month, yeah. right, that we should yeah. go, at, that should take place in Eretz Yisrael. They shouldn't do it in exile in the period beforehand. Some people, that there's more people, all the Jews are in Bava, let's do it over there. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was very strong. It has to stay in Eretz Yisrael. And uh, he asked uh, one of his students, Levi, when is, uh, um, were they Mekadosh, the Chodesh, did they establish the new month? And he said back to him, David Melech Yisrael Chai Vekayam, right? That oh, no. David oh. lives eternally. You want something? And just like, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, we're told that Rabbi Yudha Nasi was also a descendant of David. He comes from the line of Hillel, from the line of David Melech, right? And that's also eternal. And every Kiddush Levana, we say that because you know what the new moon is? The new moon is that at the end of the year, it looks like it's going to be dead and it's falling apart. And it, it's quiet and it's going to be dark. And guess what? It's Chai Vikayim. Even though it looks like it's dead, it grows again. It starts and sprouts again. And that's Rabbi Yudha Nasi. Rabbi Yudha Nasi says, David Malach is Chai Vikayim. He doesn't die. And Yaakov Avinu doesn't die. And the last thing that we'll conclude with is the prayer that we say every single day from the Rabbi Yudha Nasi. You didn't know that. You don't even have to learn Mishnah. You want to go ahead and remember Rabbi Yudha Nasi, Rabbi Noah every day. Every single morning we remember Rabbi Yudha Nasi, we say the same prayer that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said after he finished davening. What did it say, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, say after he finished davening? Here we go. Rabbi Basar Tzlo say, after you were davening, you'd say, Right? We say this in the beginning of our davening, when we finish the brachas, right? That Hashem should save us from arrogance, from chutzpah, right? And from a bad people, and from Yetzir Haraz, and from bad neighbors, and from the Satan, and from trial. All of these things, Rebbe would say this every single day. He finished his davening with this tefillah, and we begin each of our tefillahs with this tefillah of Rebbe. And Mirza Hashem, Hashem should go ahead and protect us and watch us from all of the terrible things. And we should all soon be singing David Melech Yisrael Chai Vekayam. And uh, we conclude again this series. Mirza Hashem, we'll see if we, Rabbi David wants us to have another series of this class. But in the meantime, you can certainly, those that uh, are not subscribed, can subscribe to my weekly email, can subscribe to my week my weekly WhatsApp Parsha short that I started. Uh, send me your phone number and you can get a, a WhatsApp, a 10 minute or more, <laughs> 13 minute maybe. Um, Parsha short on the Parsha each week. Um, but thank you all for coming and for listening. And Merit uh, Hashem, we should soon all be back in Eretz Yisrael again. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes, I have two questions. One, you just you said he was buried in Carmel, but in the beginning you told me he was buried in a different place. How did he get to Beit Sha'arim from No, no, Carmel? Bar Kapara, Bar Kapara, the student oh. of Rebbe, was oh. buried in Carmel. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear about that. Oh, okay. And then another question. If, the, if you said the Torah is written, it has to remain written, and what's oral should have remained oral until he broke that law. But the Torah was given orally from Hashem to Moshe. Correct. 
So that so uh, so I mean I, I, that's confusing because the Torah was an oral thing and then it was written. Well, no, originally Hashem wrote the original Torah. Uh, oh, Hashem. The Luchos we shown us were Chorus Alakim. Hashem wrote the original Torah. The and second, was, the second tablets that most what? And then it was given or didn't Hashem orally? Give it over was, to no, we have, The written Torah that we have is the same exact one that Moshe wrote on the last day of his life. That's when Moshe wrote all the Torahs that we have are traced from that original Torah that Moshe wrote down from Hashem telling him and it was then, um, and, and it was right, written right. down. So Hashem told it to him, so it was given orally and then he wrote it down. <laughs> so that's my question. Yeah, okay, but Hashem's telling him orally to write it, I guess. You know, this is what Hashem is saying, what the, I guess, the, the Pasuk that says it, these things you should write, right? I mean, that's the Pasuk. These are the things that should be written. So only these things should be written and these things should not be said over. Um, they should, they're not, they're, that, uh, but of the original things he's telling him what to write. This is what it has to be written. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you all for coming and Amir Tzashem, hopefully we will uh, see if we have a new series. If not, if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to uh, contact me and it's my pleasure. And uh, hello all my family members that are here <laughs> that have made this class. Um, okay, we're gonna I end. Fine, you're really a phenomenal